The poem is the blind man and the elephant. We'll just go through the poem first. <clears throat> the blind man and the elephant. It was six men of Hindustan to learning much inclined who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is nothing but a wall. The second feeling of the task cried, Ho, oh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp? To me, tis mighty clear, this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal and happening to take the swarming tongue within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. It is clear enough, the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth who chanced to touch the ear said, even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. So oft in theologic wars the disputants I ween rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean and prate about an elephant not one of them has seen. John Godfrey Sachs. This is a very simple story. Most of us would have uh, read this story in our childhood or it has been narrated to us. I do not know the exact original source whether it is like a Jataka or a Panchatantra tale or anything like that or some fable also says it's like a Persian uh, fable we do not know but somewhere uh, in this area only we have uh, we have the story and that is why I mean elephant is part of this part of the world of course Africa has elephant uh, but it is very famous that uh, the stories around elephant are there in India that is why he says six men of Hindustan now, the theme is quite easy and it is self-evident in this, uh, in this poem. Uh, we will we'll just go through. It was six men of Hindustan to learning much inclined. I do not know how he chose six men. Uh, probably from the description given the six different things that they are going to think and experience by touching various parts of the elephant maybe six is an optimum number that could be one of the ways but if you extend this this way why it is given as Hindustan I, again it is a you know the, uh, when Swamiji takes this poem in class also he has mentioned not this particular poem anything he said for that matter these are meant for our own imagination and thinking only it is not that thinking or imagination is something that you move uh, completely away from the set uh, pattern or rules or the or the uh, parameters that are there but uh, you can you can increase your 
thinking capacity and try to find out to, that is why Gita and other verses like Bajagavintam or other Vedantic texts are able to give contextual, relevant and new meanings for every generation. There was probably no corporate culture uh, when, when uh, Lord Krishna gave Bhagavad Gita. Much will say many centuries later, even when Nadi Shankaracharya was writing a commentary on Gita. But we do have a corporate culture now in 20th century, 21st century. But we see that the, the uh, verses of Gita are directly talking about certain concepts applicable for the corporate life also. That is the power of these. So why do we say Sanatana Dharma one angle is to understand it like this only. Sanatana means eternal. Principles are the Dharma which are not going to change over a period of time. But not only that, we give messages, meanings and guidance at every stage of life and at every way that they, they can also. In the sense that whether you, it's not that only a highly philosophical person who is a mumukshu who wants to realize the self he alone can approach Gita. No. Like a mother who will give comfort to any any son at any stage of his life. Like that is Gita giving us comfort. So you are able to interpret it. So maybe 500 years down the line some other great master, some other interpreter will come and he will find even new meanings for Gita. This is not going to any way be contradictory to the established meanings and the uh, words and uh, the other context that are given here but you can further extend it to suit the context that you are placed in also like that I am saying. So you are uh, uh, welcome to imagine that way and try to interpret it in your own way. Maybe as I said the original story was from India and therefore Hindustan is taken. The six also refers to the six darshana or the philosophies which are traditionally understood in this country and that also has actually um, different ways of understanding. The Shant Darshanas originally it was referring to let's say Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Purva Mimansa, Uttara Mimansa, Jaina Bodha like that it is. Then came Charvaka and other philosophies. So all put together there are six types of schools of philosophy that was established in this country. Okay. Maybe referring to that also we do not know. All these schools of philosophy which approach the understanding of truth have different viewpoints. See the Charmak philosophy, materialistic philosophy talks about the truth as uh, as what you see is the truth. In other words, the world as you see is the truth. There is no such thing as uh, God or Self or Atma. All these are, uh, you know, uh, useless theorizing. Birth is the beginning, death is the end, enjoy life. Ranam Kritva Gritam Pivet. Even if you want to borrow money, borrow money, but buy ghee and eat. Because you have to enjoy life. Ghee is like a rich man's food. So you enjoy life. That is one philosophy. Okay. Now, uh, our Vedanta does not talk about it. And Buddha philosophy, Buddhist, Buddhist philosophy and Jaina philosophy, they are talking about morality or ethics, but when it comes to understanding of Vedas, that is different. And their establishment of what God is, that is different. Similarly, the Mimamsakas and Nyayas and Vaisheshikas, their approach to spirit matter and establishment of God, Tattva, that is different. And that is why we are technically calling this as Darshana. Darshana, what it is, how it is different from ideology is, ideology is something that is fixed and that cannot be changed. So in that way, just think about it, we can extend it and say that how it is understood as Islam by the majority and which, which might be the correct thing also is that it is an ideology. Communism is an ideology. It is fixed and framed. The rules are there fixed. You cannot alter it. Differing from that we have in, in our Sanatana Dharma or Hinduism there is something called Shruti and there is something called as Smriti. Shruti is the, the base text, the the laws that are given, that are the Sanatana Dharma, basis of that is there. Smriti is that which is taken from the Shruti, understood from the Shruti and applied it to a particular audience at a particular point of time, in a particular geographic location. 
So, and Smriti are also not written by ordinary people, highly qualified people who have understood the essence of Vedas, they alone can. So, in other words, if Vedas are the law, then Smriti is the interpretation of the law. And who is who can interpret the law? Uh, constitution, only a highly well-read person about the constitution, he can do it. Exactly like that, one who is immersed in Vedas can do it. So, we have various Smritis at various points of time, like Parashra Smriti or Manu Smriti and various Smritis are there. But this type of a Shruti Smriti relationship, because Smriti was which was applicable thousand years back may not be applicable now. In fact, our Indian constitution now also has to be written in according to the Vedas as a Smriti only, but it is not written so. It's a different uh, area altogether when we get into it, but it's a sad story how our constitution was framed and how it was not even ratified by the free people of India after independence. And we celebrate Republic Day every January 26th. It is a farce. Okay, we are deviating. So, Smriti and Shruti are like that for us, but this type of Shruti-Smriti relationship is not there in other religions or other existing religions as of now. So, when it is not there applicable to a particular audience at a particular point of time, what was there originally seems to be applicable at all points of time. It is fixed and frozen in time. That becomes an ideology. We do not call our philosophy as ideology. It is called as Darshana. Darshana means a vision. You are able to see the truth in one, one, one level. So, a materialist, let us say, sees the truth at his level which is to see the world as a reality, but upon a greater understanding, his vision will change. He may understand certain ethics or morality, he may not see God, but his vision changes. Later, he may even raise his level to see something else as a supreme divinity or entity. That is, so from one level, your vision can be raised to the higher level and that is how it is kept actually. That is why we can call the schools of thought and philosophy, the right word to use is Darshana, okay, and that is very relevant in the context of the poem here because he says there are six men of Hindustan to learning much inclined. It is exactly like the dramatic irony we saw in the last class where, where he says a bee of most discerning taste. The bee of most discerning taste means it is stupid, it doesn't have any taste at all, right. Uh, it's called dramatic irony in a figure of speech. Like that, to learning much inclined means they are fools. That, that's all it means. In Sanskrit also they use this term. When you say Pandita Putraha. Pandita Putraha means he is son of a Pandit. Why, why suddenly you are saying he is son of a Pandit means he is, he is supposed to be a wise person but he is not a wise person. So, so in a polished way to say, you say son of a pundit. Son of a pundit means he is a fool. Like that is. Uh, King Ashoka was called as Devanam Priyaha. Devanam Priyaha means as though he is nearer to gods. Nearer to gods is a term which is technically used to put him down actually. That means he will do rituals and other things and gods are happy with rituals. But he has not risen himself to the level of Vedanta. That's all it means. It's a very uh, subtle way of saying it. So like that it is a dramatic irony here to learning much inclined. Uh, okay. They really want to learn and what, how? Who want, who went to see the elephant, underline that word see here, who went to see the elephant though all of them were blind. That's why I said it's, it is a darshana, it is a vision that you are actually perceiving. In daffodils we are going to see an inward eye. You cannot uh, view it with a fleshy eye. You need the deep vision from inside. But here, though all of them were blind, they have no capacity to see. That means, first itself, the poet makes it clear that it is impossible for them to see. It is impossible for them to see the elephant. This point has to be very clearly understood from our um, angle of Vedanta because the supreme god which is represented by the elephant in this poem is inconceivable. Your equipments have their limitations, be it your senses, be it your mind and intellect also. Mind and intellect cannot feel or think about God or conceive God. This is the declaration of the Upanishads which we went in detail when in Ken Upanishads. It says, Na tatra chakshur gachati, na vaag gachati, no mana. 
the eyes don't go there the ears don't go there the senses the prana the mind or internal nothing goes there it is not contactable by any of the sense organs so any of the, your uh, equipments they have their limitations the finite equipments cannot contact the infinite self so the poet makes the point very clear in the first stanza itself and then in this background if you understand what all the people are going through there though all of them were blind that each by observation might satisfy his mind but why do they want to then do another angle in which we can understand this line is they just want to have satisfaction that's all in other words a deep sense of commitment to see god like what swami vivekananda had must be the thirst or vision of our pursuit he was not satisfied by the great pundits giving lectures ultimately he would ask them have you seen god sir they might give explanation no have you seen god can you show me god and that was the same question as a young boy narendra he asked paramahamsa also and paramahamsa said yes and i can show it to you also so here his pursuit is not wanting to write a thesis on god or understanding god or have a argument and debate about god or to you know no certain things i so i know bhagavad gita i know vedanta i can take a class or i i know this quran and bible also i know various other uh, eastern and western literature for what bhagavad gita says a person can approach uh, god through various uh, angles in other words they are also devotees but they are having a utilitarian approach to spirituality some might uh, approach god for material wealth some might approach god for emotional solace if you are not able to uh, comfort yourself by yourself it is too much for you to handle that stress emotional stress and maybe you cannot share with others you will go to god and cry out it's not wrong but that is the level at which you use uh, spirituality or god i want to win elections i go to tirupati i want to pass in the exam i pray to god and break a coconut all these are at the material level some other people take sort of a seemingly higher stand but they are caught up at the intellectual level that they are curious to know about god about god means not in sense of really wanting to realize it and that mukshatva or that uh, great intensity is not there but they instead of knowing about worldly matters they want to know about spiritual matters that's all in, there are so many things that people are interested in astronomy astrology physics chemistry botany animals so many things economics that you are interested in computers like that this person is interested about uh, okay what kind of operation says what this superstition says what uh, that god says what is this purana say like that there is an intellectual curiosity based on which you will have immense satisfaction that does not translate automatically into any spiritual growth or spiritual evolution so that point is also indicated in this point afterwards it's very simple to go through this point so the first one approaches first approach the elephant and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side at once began to ball god bless me but the elephant is nothing but a wall so each one of them having a small stature and a limited reach they what they do is they uh, catch hold of one one part of the elephant and each part of the elephant is reminding them of already what they know so they are able to understand elephant from their previous understanding that's all it is this is the limitation so if at all any person claims there are people you are religious preachers in all religion they claim that uh, they have seen god they know what exactly god knows what exactly god wants some evil will say that they had breakfast with god and they are uh, you know like this they just uh, prattle something to the ignorant masses what what is it it is exactly like this so one person touches the uh, side of the elephant and he says it is like a wall the elephant is like a wall because it has a very broad side and his limitation is only up to that extent the second feeling of the tusk cried ho oh, what have we here so very round and smooth and sharp to me it is mighty clear this wonder of an elephant is very like a sphere in all these stanzas just go through how the blind man express themselves everybody is so sure everybody says it's very clear one person is also going to say 
even the blindest man can see so like that is their sort of conviction in bhagavad gita and in personality chart also we studied something what is known as this um, um tamasic knowledge knowledge is classified into three sattvic knowledge is that which sees the unity in diversity rajasic knowledge sees everything as different and uh, different from each other separate from each other tamasic knowledge is that which sees a small part and blows it as a whole a very limited perception that is a tamasic knowledge um, it will relate to many people in spiritual field when you approach it like this Christ alone is the savior there is no other way all others are doomed to hell and he is a big religious and spiritual preacher who is actually inspiring people how is it possible it it can be you can replace christ with anything and it applies to any religious person for that matter if he is like acting like a frog in the well and like that is each and every person looking at here it is mighty clear this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear spear is also very sharp so um he touches the tusk and comes to that conclusion the third approach the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk with his hands thus boldly up and spake i see kothi the elephant is very like a snake so he catches hold of the trunk and equates the trunk to a snake it is also calling like that it is like a snake he says the fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee he goes to the leg and he can reach up to the knee only so you can understand the size of the elephant and the size of the person so in other words how much limited we are with reference to the infinite self is the visualization so a big animal like elephant is portrayed here the fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee what most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain for him it is very clear mighty plain kothi it is clear enough the elephant is very like a tree the big legs of the elephant is looking like a or a, he is understanding it like a tree maybe a coconut tree or something like that he might have known before the fifth who chanced to touch the ear said even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most deny the fact who can this marvel of an elephant is very like a fan so he touches the ear and as you know the ear is very big and it is like a fan that's why lord ganesha is called as surpa karna you know surpa means the not fan it is what you use in kitchen i do not know what you say in english see it is there in india still some people may use they do it like this and uh, um, they segregate the finer particles of rice and other things so it is like that it's a big thing um so you can use like a fan also like that Uh, so he touches the ear and he understands the elephant to be like a fan the sixth no sooner had began about the beast to grow than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope i see quoth he the elephant is very like a rope what is interesting in all these people observing is that each and everybody has caught hold of some part of the elephant they are if only probably the men had uh, after touching the side if he had gone around and touched something else and he has gone around and touched something else maybe maybe he will come to a different conclusion not only different conclusion what would have happened is what is this i am not able to understand i don't know this type of a thing will come but how are they so sure each and every person is so sure that is what he says here and so these men of hindustan disputed loud and long they are very clear they are loud and they are long they are uh, sort of affirming their understanding each in his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong so there is now a fanatic attachment to one's own concept the fanaticism at various levels is very deadly particularly in the religious and spiritual level it is much more dangerous than at any level one can be fanatically attached to family that will create damage at the family level if a person is fanatically attached to community that will affect the community level when it is fanatically attached to uh, a concept like uh, communism and this and that it is like any other thing it will affect a bigger mass 
But biggest of all of them is the religion. If a person says this and this alone and nothing else, that is when it intrudes the freedom and liberty of others. Therefore, we see in history that almost all the wars are fought in the name of religion. It's an extension of that and all that starts with quarrel and fight and I'm, I am right and you are wrong and you have to bow down to me. This goes against the very spirit of religion. So dispute and loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong. Now, how will you not get phonetically attached? That is the question. Though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. So the idea that they have got is not wrong. But it is very limited. Once you confine your knowledge and your pursuit to that small limitation, that is when you get phonetically attached there. So always keep your vision open, broad-minded you must be in order to gain more knowledge. And you can only gain more knowledge only when you are aware of your ignorance. Therefore, the first and foremost knowledge that we gain is that I don't know. This is the first lesson, probably the last lesson that we learn. Swamiji always says in three year course in academy, if you have learned these three words, you have learned something. Which is very tough. Before you start a sentence, I know it. This is where the ignorance uh, stems as a, an arrogance, an ego that I know. So knowledge and humility go together. The first quality of a jnani is amanitto, absence of pride. So you need to have that humility, you need to have that awareness of ignorance, only then you can seek knowledge properly. And that can come only when you try to broaden your vision and uh, extend your wanting to know, that genuine wanting to know. But in this example, in this story, we see that each person has got out of something and he is very much complacent and satisfied with it. With that limited vision, what they are doing is they are fighting with each other. That is the tragedy. So, one blind man is fighting with another blind man. None of them have the vision. Swami Ramatita says, only a person who has woken up and who has eyes, he has the right to talk about the truth. But irony is that they only keep quiet. They just don't, uh, they only speak to those who come to them for knowledge because that is the way knowledge is transacted, knowledge is taken and they value it. On the other hand, who talks is a person who has very little knowledge. Absolutely little knowledge, like the empty vessel, they only make more noise. So each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. So in order to understand certain concepts, certain pointers might be given, certain things must be given. So, but you have to always remember that you have to get the overall picture of the jigsaw puzzle. Only one piece you got and you say that I have found it and don't run away. It is for you to fit it in the overall scheme of things. That is how we understand. If at all we take Mundaka, we do not know sometime in future there is a beautiful mantra which come, talks about creation. That is not connected with this point but I am saying that there are three examples given there for creation. And each and every example has a limitation. That limitation is corrected by the next example. That has another limitation. That is corrected by another example. That has limitation. Overall, you have to understand that each example is trying to convey one one point, but the overall picture you have to get, which is beyond the example. It is exactly like that. You have to understand the total picture of the elephant in the story. Exactly like that, you have to get the total visualization of the self, which is only upon realization. So, you could get hold of something, God is infinite love. It could be correct, okay? But that alone it is, and you, can, you will clean miss the point. Why is he saying that all were in the wrong is because in terms of realization till that point everybody is in the realm of ignorance only and in the realm of ignorance however much knowledgeable you are in the world you can be a PhD or can be a great uh, um, teacher, uh, preacher, anybody for that matter but with reference to the highest awakening you are still in the realm of ignorance. So all of them are still blind therefore they are wrong in their notion of the elephant. So the last answer which is given in italics gives the message. So often theologic wars, arguments and debates about God, the disputants I mean, all the people who are in, involved in that uh, debate, I think, I suppose he says, rail on in utter ignorance. They keep on talking something in utter ignorance. They don't have a clue of what they are talking. Rail on means it goes on and on and on. 
in utter ignorance of what each other mean. So each one is not even willing to listen to others because they are holding on to their views. So there can be never any consensus, conclusion or anything. See, debates in a general way are a healthy way to understand. Vade, Vade, Jayate, Tattva, Bodaha. Only by healthy argument and debate can you even come to rightful conclusions. That is required. But it is not a person holds on to one's view, which is I think called as Jalpa. In 10th chapter, Krishna says, Vada Pravadadamaham. I am the Vada amongst all the arguments. So there are different kinds of Vada. There is Vidanda, there is Jalpa, there is Vada. Um, Vidanda is talking something without arriving at any conclusion. Just for the sake of talking, you talk something. Jalpa is you hold on to something and you reject every other point of view. You won't even listen. That is all not uh, clear cut arguments or debates. Vada is you put forward to your point, then you allow others to put forward their point, then you question, then others can question. But the open mindedness to know the truth is the basis. Rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean and prate about an elephant not one of them has seen. None of them are realized. So here the truth is God is not an object of comprehension, object of your experience. It is a subject in you which actually is the real experiencer. These are the truths laid down in Upanishads. Again in the same principle we say you need not even fanatically get attached to the thought given in Upanishads or Gita but they are given in such a way for you to think about and come to your own conclusion. Not just at the intellectual level but at the realizational level. In other words you need to transform yourself into the Godhood state and experience that. Experience is again a word, but there's no other word. You have to have that Anubhava or Anubhuti. Only such a person really knows what it is. He is, he is the embodiment of that. Till such point of time, everybody will be talking about a big elephant which nobody has seen. A great poem by John Godfrey Sachs. We'll go through Swamiji's commentary. Six. Blind men went to see an elephant. They described the elephant in their own way. That the elephant was merely a wall, spear, snake, tree, fan, rope. Each certain he was right. The old were in the wrong. The poet means to draw the parallel to the ignorant who profess to know God. The elephant is huge, but lack of eyesight prevented the men from knowing it. Similarly, God is infinite. The intellect cannot conceive it, nor the mind feel it, nor the body perceive it. The human equipments cannot recognize God. Yet, some are emphatic in their description and explanation of God. The poet cautions humanity against such spiritual blindness. You must rise above fanatic belief and gain true knowledge of God. Om. 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 Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Shanti